Uh, thank you for joining us this morning and welcome to the Florida Friendly Landscaping uh, webinar series. I'm John Bossart. I'm the Extension Program Manager with the uh, FFL program and uh, I'll be introducing our speaker today. Uh, I'll also be monitoring the uh, chat box for any questions that uh, might come up. Uh, we're going to hold the majority of the questions for a Q&A session after the presentation is complete. But uh, if there's a need for a clarification during the presentation, we can, we can break in and uh, ask Dr. Hansen about that. Uh, so for today's uh, speaker, we are very pleased to have with us uh, Dr. Gail Hansen. She is an associate professor in the environmental horticulture department at the University of Florida, where she teaches the residential landscape design courses. Her teaching and extension programs focus on sustainable landscapes, urban ecology, and best design practices in residential and urban landscapes. She's also a faculty member in the Center for Land Use Efficiency, or CLU, uh, and she is our faculty advisor for the Florida Friendly Landscaping Program, as well as the statewide extension specialist in landscape design. And Dr. Hansen has an MLA and a PhD in landscape architecture from the University of Florida. And today as she is going to be speaking to us about uh, biodiversity and urban landscapes. So with that, uh, Dr. Hansen, the floor is yours. Okay, well, thank you, John, for that introduction. And I'd like to welcome everybody to the webinar. As John said, I'm gonna be talking about biodiversity for urban landscapes today. <clears throat> and uh, biodiversity has become a, a pretty important topic now when we're talking about urban landscapes. We used to not really pay that much attention to it, but um, for two reasons, it's become more important when we think of our landscapes that we create in our urban areas. And one of them is that cities are expanding and they are moving more into our natural areas. And we are seeing that in many places in Florida. And what's happening is we're decreasing the natural biodiversity when we move into those natural areas. And the other thing is when we think about future Florida landscapes, which we have been discussing a lot in um, Clue, um, we have to remember that we need to create resilient landscapes. <clears throat> and resilient landscapes are those landscapes that can withstand the environmental stressors that we will probably start to experience and in some cities already have experienced from climate change. So those would be, for example, um, longer drought periods or flooding or severe storms. And biodiversity is going to be a key component of landscapes to help us create resilient and healthy landscapes. So uh, biodiversity is short for biological diversity. And uh, what it refers to is the variety of life on earth and the interconnections between all living organisms. And it includes both uh, diversity between species and also diversity within an ecosystem. So um, you could look at the diversity of plants, animals and insects in a, in a region that has the same ecosystem or just you know the difference between plants, for example, different species of plants. And I put these two pictures on here because it, it made me think of biodiversity. I was at a, um, a garden festival in France one year and uh, these garden designers were making these very unique and fantastical designs. And this particular designer had designed Noah's Ark as his garden, but it was Noah's Ark just for plant material. And so you could walk along the side of the ark and enter the door um, and see the interior of the ark. And it was really interesting because he had created um, different biomes within the ark. And so he was showing, for example, like a desert biome and, and tropical and um, kind of showcase the different plant material. And so it really makes you think about the great diversity of plants around the world. <laughs> so 
what's important about biological diversity is that we need it. It's for basically the same reason why people need plants. Um, it's the cornerstone of our functioning ecosystems, um, the cornerstone of conservation. And uh, we need biodiverse ecosystems to give us ecosystem services. And I'm sure you've all heard of that term before. Basically, it means all the services that we get from nature. So when we talk about plants, and this particular book is, is a really uh, interesting book. I actually got it at um, Kew Gardens. And they list all the reasons why we need plants. Uh, we need them for air and water. We need it for food, medicine, clothing. Um, basically, what it gets down to is we can't survive without plants. We need it for our very survival. So we need to have biological diversity so that we receive a lot of services and we have high functioning ecosystems. But there's a couple of other things that we need to think about when we are considering creating biodiverse habitats in cities. Um, most ecologists agree now, especially urban ecologists, that you can't just have a bunch of different plants thrown together and um, expect it to be really biodiverse. It's a good start though. That, that's where you start is you have a lot of different plant types and plant species in your yard. But we also have to think about trait-based or um, functional biodiversity. So that's another level of thinking about biodiversity where we consider the functional traits of each plant that we put in that landscape. And we also uh, consider the ecological role that each of those individual plants have. And what we mean by uh, a trait-based or a functional um, trait of a plant is its ability to support other animals, insects, um, birds, whatever, other species. And they have certain traits that allow them to do that. And so we need to consider those traits to have a, a really robust um, biodiverse landscape. The other thing is that we need to think about natural land biodiversity and urban biodiversity differently. Um, this picture here shows a collection of plant material, um, obviously in a city, and it was uh, designed by man, created by man, put together by man, but it doesn't necessarily make an ecosystem because we don't know how what the relationship that these plants might have with each other, if it's a synergistic relationship. Um, it looks like a very healthy landscape and it's very visually appealing, um, but it's also an example of an urban biodiversity, which is just a collection of plants that humans created, that that includes the specific impacts that humans have on nature. So we have to think about for example, when we create nature in urban environments, um, uh, what are the decisions that we're making? So like I said, urban nature is man-made, designed and created by humans versus natural land biodiversity, which is just nature doing its thing and creating ecosystems out in nature. <laughs> So another thing that we have to consider is when we're looking at urban areas, there's a lot of threats to biodiversity. So I'm just going to quickly go through some of the issues that we have that decrease biodiversity in urban areas and some of the things that we have to think about. So first of all, we have the soil. And some people think, well, so why is soil so important for biodiversity? Well, for one reason is all plants are connected to soil. That's pretty obvious. So we need to keep our soil healthy so our plants will be healthy. And unfortunately, urban soil is usually not the greatest. Um, when we build our houses and our roads and everything, we are really disruptive to the layers, the natural um, layers that you usually find in soil. So that's one problem. And then we take our equipment, our construction equipment, and we drive all over it, we compact it, and we lose all the little um, air gaps in the soil and it makes it really hard for plants to thrive and survive in that compacted soil. 
And the other problem is then we, we pave over our roads, we put our pavers in and everything, and we seal the soil. It doesn't get as much moisture. It becomes very dry and warm. And that's also not a good um, environment to grow plants in. Another thing that we do that we really muck up when, when we build our cities is our um, hydrology patterns, the natural patterns where water flows and, and collects and so forth. Um, we totally disrupt that. We create, create our own water flows and movement. We have our stormwater systems and our stormwater ponds, which are man-made. Um, although a lot of people mistake those for natural water bodies here in Florida. But we're the ones that say where water goes and collects. And um, I gave a good example of it by putting this picture in. It's a, a brand new house that was built in a neighborhood close to mine. And I was walking through one day and I saw that the water that was draining from the downspout had totally washed out under the sidewalk and completely washed away the new turf that they had put down and also a lot of the construction sand there. So you can see what their, their um, resolution to that problem was to just um, flop a hose type system out and have all the water just flow down the driveway. Not a really good look if you're trying to sell a house. Another threat is to the vegetation. So when we clear land to build on, we pretty much destroy all the vegetation on the land. And we alter a lot of it in many different ways by putting new vegetation back on. And uh, sometimes that new vegetation that we bring in can be invasive species, which um, create a real problem in urban areas. And we also tend to create new plant combinations, mostly based on aesthetic appeal. So here's a picture I took of a, a project that I just finished working on where they um, damaged a large oak tree. Uh, a cable sliced a huge chunk out of the side of the tree when they were um, cutting down another oak tree. So their resolution to that problem was just to slap the big chunk back on and, and wrap it up with duct tape. Not sure how that's gonna work. But also uh, I wanted to show you these uh, new, these plant combinations. So this one, obviously the plants are all in containers and they can be shuffled around and you know rearranged to make new looks there and everything. But it's just an example of, of Basically, that's how we create our landscapes. They're not maybe in containers, but we just pick plants and move them around in the landscape and plant them in ways that we think look nice. <laughs> and then the last threat that's really important is the impacts to wildlife. Um, of course, we lose a lot of wildlife habitat when we're clearing land for urban projects. And also we lose a lot of specific plants that are very important for pollinators and other animals. So these two images here are, are some drawings that I did for, I think it's an Edis publication for butterfly communities. And it shows how you can create butterfly habitat along the shoreline of a, a wetland pond. And also um, in, a, in a neighborhood, how you can plant a lot of trees and, and create other types of pollinator habitat. So those are the things that um, threaten biodiversity in urban areas. So our charge or our goal is to increase that biodiversity. And one of the things that you have to think about when you are thinking about urban landscapes is they are often called novel landscapes or also called novel plant communities. Um, it means that they are new, but they are also completely different from any plant community um, that you would find in nature. So there's really no natural analog to these um, man-made plant communities. They are a combination of new species that you probably won't find in a natural area um, because we don't have access to all the native plants um, in our nursery. So it's almost impossible in an urban area to recreate that entire ecosystem. But one of the things that we can think about is, can we, um, in some manner, um, recreate the ecosystem function of, of any particular ecosystem? So this picture here shows a uh, man-made wetland. 
it's obvious that it's man-made because nature wouldn't put, you know, a pathway in it and um, terraces with block walls and a rectangular pool. Um, but it was designed to have water flow down the terraces through vegetation and clean the water. And the water that ends up in the pool actually does support a lot of wildlife. And when we toured this, um, we could see a lot of um, reptiles and amphibians and insects and birds and fish in the pond. So at some level, it does recreate the ecosystem function. It doesn't look anything like a um, natural wetland, but on some level, it's, it's pretty successful in creating the function. So that's something that we can do in urban areas. And so we wanna think about the plant materials that we use as far as if they're native or near native or exotic, um, because we can use all those plants and still have an ecological approach to our, our landscapes. Um, when we design a landscape like this where we're trying to solve an environmental problem, it's called positive disturbance, um, as opposed to what we normally see in urban areas, which is negative disturbance. So let's talk about this concept of adapted plants. Adapted plants can be native, near native or exotic plants. And basically what it means is they are all plants that have adapted to the local conditions of a region or neighborhood or whatever, and that they will thrive and um, do well in that region. So some of you may not be familiar with the term near native. I'm, I've been reading and hearing about that a lot more. And a near native plant is a plant that's been, let's take Florida as an example, a plant that's been in Florida for so long that there might even be some debate about whether it's native or not, but it is well adapted to the environmental conditions of Florida. And, um, and then there's also exotic plants, you know, or ornamental plants that are also well adapted. And of course, the one plant category that we don't want to put in our landscape are the invasive plants. But all of those plants, native, near native, and exotic, can add to biodiversity. This picture in here is just to show that even turf can be a part of that um, plant selection for biodiversity. Um, you know, in the Florida Friendly Program, we say you don't want to have a lot of turf because then you have a monoculture, which is the exact opposite of biodiversity. Um, but some turf um, can be in a biodiverse landscape. And this one shows great diversity in different um, types of plants like ground cover, shrubs, trees, and so forth. So a lot of people ask me, well, how can I tell if uh, a, a landscape is biodiverse? Um, is there you know, things I can look at and see that will tell me that? And there are definitely some things. Um, here's two contrasting landscapes. One of them has a high number of plants and a high variety of different plants. And if you spend some time in that landscape, um, up in the upper right-hand corner, that's uh, one that we put in, um, on the UF campus, you will be able to observe a, a pretty high number of insects um, flying around and crawling around and a lot of animals um, in this landscape, including snakes. Um, but if you look at the photo on the bottom left, um, that would be a landscape with pretty much zero biodiversity. So you have altogether maybe about three plants there. The shrubs are the same plant and the trees, all three of them were the same tree. So you have turf, one shrub and one type of tree. So definitely not biodiverse. So um, that's what you can see visually. But there are also some differences that you can't see. And um, a lot of that is below our feet in the soil. Um, there's a huge number and variety of soil microbes and fungi and, and arthropods and other small animals that live in soil that we don't just normally see. And then there's also all the plant growth that is beneath the surface. Um, this picture here is obviously not in Florida, but I thought it was a really great picture to show a uh, root mass of trees. I took this on a hiking trail in um, John Muir Woods, uh, north of San Francisco. What you can't see is the trunk of the tree, which is just out of the picture. But this is all the, the roots of the tree that were exposed when they you know, cut away the bank for the path. Um, 
pretty kind of cool landscape actually there. And the other thing that you cannot see in plants is the functional traits. You really can't tell unless you take a long time to observe a plant, like what insects or what plants that they will support. And so that, for that, you have to do a little bit of research about the different plants. So I'm going to give an example for a, a residential landscape because resi residential landscapes are very important in um, Florida cities. Uh, one thing about residential yards is we don't know a whole lot about them. It's probably the most understudied and underappreciated ecosystem that we have. Um, it's understudied because, you know, it's private property. It's hard to get on private property to do studies. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and there's, there's some, also some other issues with residential yards. And one is that there's such a huge variety of yards because, you know, they're, they're designed by people. So really the plant choices on them are at the whim of the person designing it. Um, <clears throat> That it would be really hard if you only studied one or two to generalize what you find to all other residential yards. Um, one thing about uh, yards though that we have to remember is even though they're small, they have a high impact on people. And what I mean by that is that this is private property. Um, <coughs> uh, property value is tied up a lot with uh, residential designs. Um, there's social norms, social is issues in your neighborhood. Uh, people want to keep up with the Joneses, for example. So, uh, and also maintenance costs. A, a lot of people put a lot of money into their landscapes. So there's a lot of human issues or social issues tied up with this particular landscape. <clears throat> and studies have shown that uh, if you put together all the landscapes in a city, like parks and um, schoolyards and road right of and everything, that the residential landscapes um, make up about 35% of those total landscapes. So that's about a third. So they are a significant green space in cities. <clears throat> hey, Gail. Yes. It's Wendy. We got a couple of questions, I think, for clarity. Uh, okay. Marilyn is wondering, um, we've, she's heard that we're trying to move away from the word exotic. And mm -hmm. she wanted to get your input on that. Um, I have heard that too, that because some people find it a little bit confusing, but I haven't, have not heard what a good substitute for that particular um, word is. And also um, when you're looking back at all the research that has been done and documents that have already been written, that's a very common term. So we still kind of have to recognize that term. Okay. because we're going to see it a lot in, in written work. Um, but if anybody has a suggestion for a better term, I'm not sure what what people would prefer to call it. Oh, there's some, uh, Jacqueline suggests non-native, um, which yeah. is not bad. And how large was the novel plant community that you showed? Uh, the wetland, the, the um, created wetland. Um, yeah. I would guess that that was probably took up about a, a quarter to half an acre. <clears throat> okay. It wasn't really huge. Okay. And then uh, Don is asking on the last slide, would you consider that uh, biodiverse? Uh, no, not necessarily because there's a lot of repeat of the same plant material in there. Um, I just put that in there because uh, it's a pretty typical Florida landscape. <laughs> okay, Gail, thank you very much. I'll, I'll check back in with you. Okay, thanks. <laughs> so a lot of people again ask, uh, what are the, the characteristics of a biodiverse yard? Because um, more and more people are becoming interested in creating diversity in their yards and they wanna know what they should look for or what should be in that yard. <clears throat> so first step is a large variety of plants. So one of the things that you want to make sure that you do is you have different types of plants. So you want to have, for example, trees and shrubs and grasses and vines and ground cover. And then within those types of plants, you want to have a variety of different species. So for example, you might 
plant 10 trees on your site, but you don't want all 10 of them to be the same tree, the same species. You can have, you know, half of them, five of them, five different species or 10 or whatever. But the key is that you have variety of types and then variety of species. <clears throat> Another thing when you're looking at a biodiverse yard is that try to mix in a lot of different shapes and sizes of plants. <clears throat> One thing that it will do is help uh, improve the visual quality of the landscape. But the other thing is that um, for a variety of wildlife, they need different shapes and types. Some you know, need trees, some need more shrubs, some need more ground cover, but they also need different shapes in their shrubs because of the way they might, you know, um, lay eggs or uh, nesting or food or whatever. So um, when you're looking at your plants, make sure that all your shrubs just aren't, you know, mounding round shrubs, but you have some that have very different shapes and sizes. <clears throat> um, you would like to have a mix of native, near native, and non-native plants. So there you go. There's non-native instead of exotic. <laughs> um, preferably more toward more natives, mostly, and more of the, what we call the near natives. Um, although there's some very good ornamental plants that also support a lot of um, other animal and, and um, insect species too. But you also want to remember that um, <clears throat> all of the plants, regardless of which one of that mix they're in, uh, need to be well adapted to the environmental conditions of your yard. So uh, right plant, right place. And that, that goes for any type of yard that you're doing, biodiverse or not, you always want to remember um, to use that first principle for Florida-friendly landscapes. <clears throat> The other thing that you want to look for in a yard is you want to have more um, structure with the plant material. And that is referring to the arrangement of the plants. Um, in particular, vertical layering is really important because if you want to support other species, there's a lot of um, animals that uh, will forage on the ground and then go up into the canopy, uh, maybe for nesting, for example. And they move up and down this vertical ladder that you're going to create um, by having some low growing plant material and then some in the middle range, maybe some um, shorter shrubs and then taller shrubs and then small trees and large trees. That way you'll be able to accommodate a lot of different uh, animals in your um, yard. And then the other thing that you wanna think about is visual appeal. And that's really important because we do know that people actually care more about landscapes and will take better care of landscapes that have a good visual quality, that they're just aesthetically pleasing. We also have to remember that these are yards in urban areas. So there's that human aspect again, <clears throat> where you want your yard to look nice. I mean, most people don't put plants in the yard to look bad. They want to have a beautiful, pretty yard to look at. So when you're thinking about the structure and arrangement of these plants, think about the visual appeal. <clears throat> so another part of that visual appeal is having organized complexity. <clears throat> Humans like complexity. They like things to be different. Uh, it makes your yard more interesting but they don't want it to be so complex that it looks chaotic. So you want to organize your plant material in a way. And the easiest and best way to do that is repeat plants throughout your landscape. And also, um, <coughs> excuse me, try to cluster your plants so they have more impact in the landscape for visual appeal. Um, for example, the picture on the top right that was taken at a, a garden in Stetson University next to the president's house, and it's all native plants. So you have the pineland lantana in the front, and the large masses of it, and some Pakahatchee grass in the back. And so by clustering those, those plants have more uh, impact, visual impact in the landscape. <clears throat> I put this uh, plan view in just to show how you can uh, 
<clears throat> as you're planning your landscape, how you can have repetition in there. So if you look by the patio, for example, of that particular um, plan, and you see the plants with the yellow color in it, they're repeated around the patio. You have plants, um, for example, with orange color in it by the pathway, it's repeated. So that shows what we mean by repetition, because when people look around the landscape and they see these different groups, um, it helps to connect the landscape. <clears throat> So a lot of people ask me, well, how do I start creating a biodiverse yard? I mean, I've already got plants in my yard. I wanna make it more biodiverse. So what's my first step? What do I do? Well, it's very similar to um, creating a, a new yard or any landscape, actually. It's, <clears throat> you wanna start with your site inventory and your site analysis. So what you need to do is you need to walk around your yard and on a piece of paper, write down the total number of plants that you have on your, in your yard and where they're located. Then identify how many different types and species you already have in your yard. <clears throat> and then the other thing you wanna do is research those plants that you have and see if you can um, find out how many other species that they support. <clears throat> this is the hard part actually, when thinking about biodiversity. Sometimes it's very hard to find information about what an individual plant, you know, what insects will use it or what animals we will use it. So it can be kind of the frustrating part. Um, it's not always easy information to find. But if you can find some information, it'll help you know how biodiverse your yard already is. <clears throat> then you want to think about the function in your yard. Decide how you want your yard to function. You would do this in, in any kind of a design that you do. Um, do you want to support more wildlife, for example? And if so, um, <clears throat> you'll have to think about layering, especially like for birds. Um, do you want to have more pollinators in your yard? Do you want to see butterflies? Um, what about the visual appeal? Do you want to have a place for your kids to learn more about nature? Or do you want to grow more edibles? Edibles can count in that, in that uh, plant list that you are going to have for biodiversity. So know what you want to happen in your yard and what you want to do in your yard. Your next step, like you would with any landscape, is to think about a style that you would like. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, we wanna think about style because it's gonna guide you in your plant selection. And you can visualize then a little bit better what your final product will look like. So when you choose a landscape style, that is also gonna help you think about plants that are gonna support that style. So for example, the picture in the upper right, that would be a landscape that might be, you might find in a coastal community here in Florida. The picture in the bottom left, that's not in Florida, but I couldn't find another good picture of a landscape that is a very strong style. In this case, this is a contemporary Asian landscape, but I think it still illustrates the point nicely because it shows that even though um, it's a, kind of like a Japanese style garden, there's still a great variety of plants in there. This particular landscape had been recently installed, so the plants have not grown to quite their full size yet but there was a, a really good um, variety of plants within this landscape, which was actually very small in the front yard of um, somebody's house. <clears throat> so your next step is you're gonna make your plant list. So assuming that you are wanting to put more plants in your yard, first thing to think about, right plant, right place. So remember what the conditions of your yard are and always check that as you're creating your list. After you have put all the plants that you think you want to use in your yard, check for variety. Do you have a lot of different types of plants? Um, do you have a good variety of different species within those types? Um, do your research also on these plants. See if they will support a variety of insects and animals. Again, it might be a little challenging, but do your best to find that information. Um, and also look at your list and say, you know, look at it for that 
visual appeal? Does it have a variety of sizes and forms and colors? Which is not just for visual appeal. Um, as I mentioned earlier, you want to have those different forms for um, the needs of different animals. And then decide if you're going to reduce or remove any of your existing plants. So a lot of people ask about turf. Like, where does that fall in that kind of biodiversity plant list? And um, you would be surprised probably to learn that turf actually does support a lot of insects. And those insects also support a lot of birds. Um, there's particularly beetles, for example, um, live in turf. And you will often see birds pecking at them um, in a turf landscape. So there is a place for turf. And of course, all the different animals that grow in amongst the root mass of the turf too. So it does have a place in a biodiverse landscape, but obviously you don't want to have a yard that's like 90% turf because then you're leaning much more toward monoculture. So now you've picked your plants, uh, you've made a plan. Uh, you have to think about the organization of the plants. So again, let's go back to that vertical layering and the plant clusters. You want to organize them so that you um, have ground cover in areas and then you have your small and your large shrubs and your small and your large trees. And um, put the, arrange them in a way that it's aesthetically pleasing but also would be helpful to wildlife in, that, in their movement, vertical movement up and down and also creating just kind of different spots in the yard where, you know, wildlife can hang out. So now we've encouraged you to uh, create a more biodiverse yard, kind of giving you some tips on how to go about doing that. So we would expect some benefits for doing that. I mean, it could be a lot of work and we want to have some benefits. So for the homeowner in particular, uh, they will have a healthier yard, having a, a greater uh, variety of plant material. And believe it or not, it's usually less maintenance. Although some people, if they saw a yard like the one in the picture would immediately think that's a high maintenance yard. Um, but typically it will be less maintenance if you pick the right plants, obviously. And a healthier yard means better plant survival. So you may not have as many yards that, or as many plants that are going to um, die on you. <clears throat> but in the big picture, it also contributes to overall environmental health and uh, makes strengthens our ecosystem services that we depend on. And <clears throat> it's also a good way for you to contribute to helping other species in urban areas survive and not just survive, but thrive. There's actually uh, a lot of wildlife that live in cities. Um, when I was doing research for an urban ecology book that I wrote, I, I was amazed to learn how many different um, animals and insects actually do live in cities and do well. And mostly it means that they've adapted to humans basically and, and um, can live among them. Some people are a little hesitant to create a more biodiverse yard because they have some thoughts about it. There are perceived barriers to creating that yard. And one fear is that it's going to look really wild and messy. <clears throat> so some people would not actually like the two pictures that are shown below, <coughs> which are biodiverse yards. Um, they also have a lot of native plants in them. So that's one of the things that people are concerned about with native plants too. But it doesn't have to look wild and it doesn't have to look messy. As we just showed you, there are you know, design things that you can do to make it look fairly organized, um, still make it interesting and um, kind of bypass the messy look. A lot of it depends on the plants you choose too. Uh, some of them fear looking too different from their neighbors. So that's the social aspect. Um, there's social norms in neighborhoods. There's an expectation for what your yard should look like and that you should fit in with the neighborhood. But again, you can have a very biodiverse, very nice yard um, that can fit into any typical neighborhood. Some people, again, uh, 
are worried about maintaining it, um, that's mostly a lack of knowledge. And so that's an, a barrier that can be overcome. And the other big one is attracting unwanted wildlife. So for example, you're trying to make your yard more biodiverse so you can support more wildlife, but there are certain ones you may not want in your yard. And in particular, almost everybody mentions snakes <clears throat> as being that unwanted wildlife. Um, but you know, you know, one thing that they have to remember is in just about any urban landscape, biodiverse or not, um, you're gonna find snakes. It's just that they're pretty good at hiding and you don't usually see them, but they're there. <clears throat> Especially if you live by a, um, a wetland or a, um, a stormwater pond, um, you will have snakes. And even if your yard is not biodiverse, you will, it reminds me of a project that I worked on where I had a client, she had a small front yard, but she came home one day and found a big snake in her house <clears throat> and um, more or less panicked. She called someone to get the snake out of her house, but she also um, was very concerned that the snake came from her yard. Well, her yard happened to be all Confederate jasmine nothing but confederate jasmine and so she called someone a landscape contractor and she told them to tear out all of it and so then she called me and i went over to her house and, and her yard was nothing but bare dirt and so there you go there's a snake in a total monoculture of nothing but confederate jasmine <clears throat> So another barrier is the perceived characteristics of native plants. So that's why some people kind of shy away from that. Again, <clears throat> this whole idea that they look kind of weedy, and some of them do, but there are design tips that you can do, like uh, instead of scattering them individually throughout a landscape, um, plant them close together so they look more like a dense cluster. Um, <clears throat> some people feel like they only look good when they're in bloom. And even when they're in bloom, they say they're not that colorful because the flowers are so small. Again, clump them. <clears throat> put, put you know, your plants together in, in clumps and then they'll look like a bigger mass of color. <clears throat> and some people complain because they say they all look the same. In this particular picture here, they do sort of look the same, but that's easy to overcome because there's a lot of native plants that look very different. <clears throat> So some tips for fitting in. If you're afraid that it's just not gonna fly in your neighborhood and people aren't gonna like your yard, one of the things that you can do is make sure that you plant that low ground cover or turf strip <clears throat> in the front of your yard. So it's the first thing that people see you know, along the curb. Um, that helps to kind of um, counteract the complexity of all the plant material behind it. <clears throat> And so it's a nice contrast. The other thing that you want to do is you can walk around your neighborhood, look at the typical style, try to replicate the style. So it looks similar, even though you have a lot of different plants in it. And uh, another technique is to use a lot of large evergreen plants, um, because if your native plants go down in the winter and you have some a lot of bare patches, those evergreen plants, which are bigger and kind of create the bones of the landscape will still be there. And so your landscape will still look good. <clears throat> other tips for fitting in is use other materials, hardscape materials. Use some gravel, some mulch and boulders because you can put like pathways and plant beds and that will help you organize your plant material. Um, it'll also uh, encourage people to walk through it and enjoy the plant material. Um, <clears throat> And then if you're using a lot of native plants, just put them in that more traditional arrangement again, like um, clusters, like the picture in the bottom right, with the exception of a couple of plants there, those are all um, native wildflowers. You can see they're very colorful, they're in clusters, so they have more impact. And um, so those are some things that you can do to help with the organization. For example, if you put a big boulder in your yard, that's a good, way to um, organize plants around it to help with that clustered look. And I think this is the last slide here for tips for fitting in. Um, use architectural features. 
<clears throat> for example, um, porches, fences, patios, and so forth to help organize your plant material. Um, bird feeders and bird baths and bird houses. Um, I've read several studies that are really interesting and they say if you if you have a lot of native plants in it and it looks a little mm, wild or scraggly, that if people see bird houses or bird baths, they will make the connection between why you have the plants that you have them. And then they're like, okay with that because they say, oh, that's a wildlife habitat. And, and that's cool that they're supporting wildlife. And suddenly that, you know, landscape looks good to them. And the other thing is like fences and garden walls. So you can see in the picture on the um, bottom right, there's a, uh, a lot of um, native plants there and some wildflowers, very mounding. But what's really nice about that is that that picket fence with the um, curved top on it is the one element that cuts through the entire front yard and it ties together all of the landscape. And it keeps the plant material from looking a little bit too wild. It's kind of a, a human touch, uh, shows a little more civilization in the landscape. So I, uh, this is the last slide and then I just scanned some book covers here of some books that I like and that I use. They're not necessarily specifically on biodiversity for residential yards. I have not been able to find a book that um, addresses that specifically. But these uh, books, especially the beautiful no mow yards um, and the new low maintenance garden have a lot of uh, design ideas that really encourage biodiversity. And uh, same with the other one, Lawn Gone, it has um, alternatives to turf that will also create more biodiversity in the yard. And then a couple of the EDIS publications that I've written along with uh, Claire Lewis from the Florida Friendly Program um, these are not specifically on biodiversity, but they do um, have some strategies in them that, that will help, you know, to create a more biodiverse yard. And since we don't have any EDIS publications on biodiversity in yards, I think that is probably going to be my next um, EDIS publication. I'll try to write a publication that has all the information in it that I just gave you uh, in this presentation. So any questions? Gail, we've got a question um, about uh, along these lines about resources is, do you know of, of a good landscaping software that might include some of these concepts? Is there a, is there a software that you like for these sort of things? Oh, you know, I, I don't know of any that would include specifically these concepts. There's some fairly good software out there uh, we need to, my graduate student and I wrote an EDIS publication. <clears throat> I think it's still on um, in EDIS. Uh, we tested like 10 different uh, software programs. And I think if you look at that, the ones that we recommended are still on the market and they're updated you know, periodically. So I think those would be the best choices. Um, there's a few free ones that you can download, but they're not, not great, obviously. Um, so I think if you refer back to that, that okay. EDIS publication, you'll find some good, good, good. ones. Good answer. Um, someone uh, mentioned, you did talk about snakes, uh, but somebody was, uh, mentioned, wondered about coyotes, wondered how you felt about that. Coyote, <laughs> coyotes, yes. Um, <clears throat> you know, they are becoming a, a big problem in urban areas because they have adapted to humans. And um, they do, uh, you know, just like the raccoons, a lot of people don't like raccoons in the yard. Um, they have found food sources from humans, um, but they can be dangerous. Um, you know, I've seen pictures of them roaming streets in, in large cities. <clears throat> they can be dangerous. So here's the thing about when you're creating habitat for wildlife, you can't put up a sign and say, all wildlife welcome except for snakes and coyotes. <clears throat> and especially if you are trying to attract insects and birds, that's where snakes are going to go. 
um, because, you know, birds and bird eggs are food for snakes. And so there's just no way you're going to stop snakes from coming in if you're attracting, you know, uh, lizards and frogs, because those are also food for snakes. They will go where the food source is. Coyotes, you know, um, they'll also go where the food source is. So if you're attracting small mammals, you have, if you have squirrels or I have um, bunny rabbits in my yard and they're great to watch. Um, <clears throat> I'm always worried that a hawk is gonna swoop down and snag them. Um, <clears throat> so I don't have a good answer for that, except that if you see a coyote in an urban area, you should be cautious and you should try not to leave garbage out because they they're scavengers, just like uh, raccoons. And um, some people say that you should limit like bird, bird food and stuff like that because um, for one, it might, it's not necessarily great to feed birds. That's, uh, I don't know if there's a consensus on that, but um, food like that also attracts squirrels and obviously other animals. Okay, well, there uh, folks, are, 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 folks are chiming in and in, in, you know, really <clears throat> understanding that everything plays a part in our, in our uh, ecosystem. And right. so some are saying, I, I appreciate the snakes because they take care of the rats or, and some snakes fight off venomous snakes and right. they're all, all important in our habitat. But uh, I've got a couple of good questions here. Um, uh, one is they, someone has a yard that borders a conservation area. What mm -hmm. do you think about creating that natural fence or border or maybe some plant suggestions for that? Well, um, you do have to be careful about plants, uh, you know, some plants, um, if you use native plants, some of them can be aggressive growers. So they're not invasive, they're not classified as invasive, but they can grow aggressively. So you wanna think about the native plants that you're using and whether they're going to start spreading into the natural area and displacing some of the plants that are already there. I would guess if you walked through that natural area, you would already see some plants that are the more aggressive growers and you know take up more space in that natural landscape too. Um, and even though it's a conservation area and a natural landscape, my guess is you might even see a few invasives in there too. Um, but I, I think that the best way to approach that is make sure that the native plants that you're using are the ones that are close to that, that interface between that conservation area and your yard. And then maybe try to make sure that the ornamental plants or the non-native plants um, maybe, uh, for example, would be reserved for more of your um, plants that are your foundation plants around your house or your front yard, for example because most of us don't have our front yard bordering a conservation area, it usually borders a road. And, um, and uh, just be careful about your selection of, of native plants. And Okay, good, really good answer. Um, and then Mary Ann uh, says her neighbors have huge lawns, she's not a fan. What do you think of artificial turf as a narrow strip in front of a native border? You know, uh, that's actually being used a lot, not so much, you know, in front of a native border, but in a lot of houses in South Florida, especially some high end homes, we're seeing a lot more use of artificial turf. So one thing is artificial turf doesn't add anything to an ecosystem. It, it, it has really no functional, you know, um, a, anything functional to it to create or help improve an ecosystem or ecosystem services. It's not quite as bad as it used to be. They've, they've managed to design it now so that water can flow through. Um, it doesn't get quite as hot as it used to under the artificial turf and it doesn't sterilize the soil as much. But I, I think, you know, if it's just a really small strip and you're having trouble growing anything else in that area, any other low growing ground cover, um, maybe you could use it if it's just a tiny area. I generally would say you want to avoid using it. But I do recognize that there are areas in our landscapes which just become kind of a maintenance nightmare. Like we can't grow anything there. It, it, um, it's a place where you have a lot of erosion. It's just a problematic area. 
In that case, you might actually even be better off using hardscape and putting yeah. some stone or something in there because, you know, lizards like to hang out on warm rocks and maybe it makes a better lizard habitat if you, you know, use stone or something else like that. So I generally would not recommend that you use any artificial turf, but if you have a problem area where you've tried everything, um, yeah, go ahead and use it. <laughs> Yeah, but I would, you know, try everything you can. Try everything, yeah. Um, and then I think for our last question, Gail, um, Sylvia is wanting to know how can I get the landscape design folders you showed um, download and order those folders? You mean the uh, EDIS publication? Yes. Um, yeah, if you go on to the University of Florida website, and up in the corner where it says search, if you type in EDIS publications or just EDIS um, and then hit the search and it'll pull up the EDIS website. And then in the search box there, you can just type in my name and all of my EDIS publications will come up. They're all downloadable PDF. So you can just open it and click on download PDF and you'll have it. So there's, um, I think there's about 30 EDIS publications, most of them on landscape design issues there. They're, they're all excellent. And then Vernal wants to know what your thoughts on Wadelia are. Um, <laughs> so hasn't Wadelia been listed as an invasive plant? Yes. Yes, and that was quite a while ago that it was. Um, so I would say get rid of it if you have it in your yard. Um, I know it, it works nicely in some areas like on slopes and stuff, but it's an invasive plant and it should be taken out. Yeah, there's better alternatives. Yes. And then, um, the Myra is wondering uh, about, now this is an interesting a whole other ball of wax, but uh, about giving bird food, uh, feeding the birds. So I, I'm not an expert on birds or on bird habitat. That would be a good question for Mark Hostetler. Um, and he has Edith's publications on birds too. I have heard pros and cons. <clears throat> I think that generally you would like to provide more natural um, bird food, you know, with um, seeds and berries and so forth if you can. But sometimes if you have a yard where you can't put a whole lot of plant material in with these different natural food sources. <clears throat> you could supplement with some bird feed, but so I'm gonna say, I don't really know the answer because I've heard both sides of the story, but Mark Hostetler can tell you more about that. <clears throat> well, Gail, I know that if you plant plants that the birds like, that's probably one of the best ways to feed yes. the birds, you know? And, uh, and I think that's pretty much when we're thinking about that, that's what biodiversity is about. So that is that's... exactly. And the other thing is that there's issues about birds becoming dependent on being fed when you put out um, feed for the birds. And then, um, you know, for example, if, if you're not able to do that, then they're, they're not, you know, they're, they're dependent on, they're not good at seeking out food on their own. I'm not sure if that's how true that is, but I have heard that. And then um, other people say that they're necessarily not getting the best diet if it's just, you know, bird seed that you're feeding them that they need to have. For example, insects are hugely important for um, young juvenile birds because they need the protein <clears throat> that insects provide for growth and they grow very quickly. So they need high, high protein diets. So hopefully they're also out there picking up all the bugs and grubs and other insects that they need to. Great, great, Gail. Um, so I think I want everyone to know that this uh, presentation will be recorded, has been recorded and will be posted on the Florida Friendly Landscape website within about a week or two. It also will be posted on the YouTube channel with closed captions. So that's nice for everyone if they want to read instead of listen. So that will be good to catch all the all the small parts. And uh, John, if you're there and you want to wrap it up with Gail, this would be a good time. OK, well, thank you, Wendy. Uh, I just wanted to say uh, thank you to Dr. Hansen for her wonderful presentation today. 
I uh, hope everybody got uh, some very good information out of that. And do please check the EDIS publications. Uh, Dr. Hansen has many of them. There are many Florida Friendly Landscaping uh, EDIS publications as well. Um, so uh, thank you for joining us today, everyone. Uh, and we hope to have you with us again for our next Florida Friendly Landscaping webinar. Thanks a lot. Bye -bye. Thanks, everyone.